Cool. Hello, everyone. So um, I'm Elizabeth, and I'm going to be presenting today on ETH Monero atomic swaps, um, as well as um, privacy concerns related to atomic swaps. So and I'm also going to be doing a live demo. Um, so I've been working on the implantation of this, and I'm going to do a live demo on StageNet um, during this presentation. Oh, OK, thank you. Cool. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Um, so yeah, my name is Elizabeth, like I said. I've been a blockchain protocol level developer for um, slightly over four years now. Um, so kind of started off on like the Ethereum Solidity side and then since then worked on um, a few various different like blockchain node implementations. Um, so like Polkadot, Cosmos, um, Ethermint, um, and the Filecoin Rust implementation. Um, and yeah, and I've kind of always had an interest in privacy. That's kind of how I got into Monero. Um, I did a project in my undergrad on trying to add more privacy to Ethereum, basically throwing ring signatures onto Ethereum, but didn't really go anywhere because the, the gas fees um, were really, the block gas limit was too low essentially to do it. So yeah, but that's kind of how I got into all the Monero crypto stuff. Um, cool, so a little demo. Um, sorry, so the summary of what I'm going to do. So first, I'm going to start a demo for um, StageNet. So if anyone doesn't know, StageNet is basically like mainnet narrow, but with no value. Um, so I'm going to start a demo for that, and it's probably going to take around 20 minutes, ideally. So I'm going to first start it, and then at the end, we'll look at it again. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to go over the motivation for the project, um, development progress, and protocol deep dive maybe, at, if I have time, I might move it up to the end. Um, and then yeah, mostly pr privacy and security implications. Um, and then yeah, just next steps for the project. Okay, cool, so I'm gonna start the demo. Yeah, so if you guys don't know, um, basically atomic swaps are a trustless peer-to-peer -peer swap um, between only two parties. So um, yeah, so basically I'm gonna demo um, a swap between a party that holds um, ETH on the Gorley network, which is a, a test net for Ethereum. And then I'm also, and then the, there's gonna be another party that holds StageNet Monero, and they're gonna do an atomic swap. Um, so yeah, so let's, so I'm just going to start this right now. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so sorry, first I'm gonna actually make my terminal bigger. Um, do, 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 do. Whatever. Okay, cool. So first I'm gonna go into a remote node. So I'm gonna do it like um, how it would probably be done in real life. So you would basically have some remote Monero provider and then a, um, for example, like an ETH offer taker on your normal, your local machine, essentially. So let me just, I hope you guys can see the term. I'm gonna show a UI also, so it's not gonna be like all terminal. <laughs> um, Cool, so first I'm just gonna start um, a node on my remote machine that is going to be um, the Monero provider, which we're gonna just call Bob. Um, so, whoops. So, yeah, so essentially the Monero provider has a Monero wallet CLI wallet open um, with access to the Monero. It has access also to an Ethereum key um, and an Ethereum endpoint, obviously, and um, as well, there's already the swap contract that's been deployed on the Gurley network. Um, so it's gonna also just use that. Um, cool. Do, do, do. Um, the machine's really slow. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm then going to start another node on my machine. Um, and these are just like swap nodes, essentially. So they're just part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so yeah, so I'm just making sure. So yeah, so I'm gonna now start the, the Alice node, which is the ETH holder. Um, same idea, it has like an um, Ethereum private key that holds the testnet ether, um, and it's just gonna connect to the remote node. So yeah, I just started it right now. Yeah, so they should hopefully connect. Um, yeah, okay, peer count one, okay, cool. So, and then I'm just gonna start a third node um, that's just gonna like be there, but it's not going to actually do, it's not gonna take part of the swap. It's just going to essentially, so I can show on the UI that there's gonna be multiple um, offers. So I'm just gonna start that in the background as well. 
Um, okay, cool. So now I'm going to make an offer on the remote node. Um, sorry, can you hold this for a second? Uh, thanks, sorry, I need to get the IP again. <laughs> uh, this is a little squished, I think. So I'm gonna move these to another terminal or another work screen. Okay, um, cool, so I'm just gonna make the offer now. Uh, where is it? Okay, so cool, so it's gonna make an amount, it's gonna make an offer, um, it's gonna connect to this Bob remote node. Um, the offer is gonna have a minimum amount of 0.1 Monero, maximum amount of seven. So for example, like if you only have seven Moneros, you would put that as the max amount. Um, and it's gonna have a certain exchange rate, so basically the ratio that you wanna swap at. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna make it and Okay, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> um, is my node working? Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna reduce the maximum amount because I feel like maybe I did too many before and now I'm running out of amount. Okay, okay, I think I just didn't have enough stage at Monero. Okay, we're good, we're good. Cool, okay, um, so now I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm just gonna start the UI now. So, do, do, do. Um, okay, okay, I'm starting the UI and then it should connect to my, um, the node on my machine and, oops. And then it's just running on a local port. Um, so right now it should just show one peer and one offer. Yeah, okay, cool. So that's my offer. And I'm just going to, on, on here, I'm just gonna show that basically you can have like multiple offers. Um, do, do, do. Uh, one second, I have a lot of terminals. Wait, sorry. Basically, okay. Okay, cool. So uh, there should be another offer up. Um, okay, let's refresh. Hopefully it shows up. Do, do, do. Oh, okay, wait. I kind of messed up. Um, it's right now making, okay, whatever. There's two offers essentially, but they're just for the exact same amount. So it's like overlapping, but anyways, um, let me just cancel that. Um, sorry, let me redo that. So I'm gonna make this one have a different amount. Okay, uh, refresh this now, should be better. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so now you can see the two distinct offers. Okay, so now I'm just gonna start the actual swap process. There's a lot of setup because I'm running all the nodes. Normally there wouldn't be that much setup, you just would open the UI essentially. Um, and yeah, and right now the private keys are on the back end, but we want to essentially put um, a MetaMask integration so you can assign with your MetaMask. Um, so it's all in your browser. So yeah, I'm just gonna swap 0.05 ETH for one Monero, hit swap, and then it should, we should see in the logs that it initiated. Okay, cool, so it initiated. Um, and then it should show, where's my other one here? Okay, yeah, so we can see that um, the stage is being updated. So I'm gonna leave this now to run for about 20 minutes because SageNet blocks can take a while, so that's why it takes so long. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna go back to my presentation. Cool, okay, so yeah, so a bit about the why um, that I started this project. Um, currently, there's a few methods you could use to essentially get Monero. Um, so one of them is basically a centralized exchange, which is probably, I don't know, it's probably one of the easiest amounts, or sorry, easiest ways to get um, Monero. Um, however, obviously, this is, not really a good solution for long term because it's centralized, um, it's trusted, it's custodial. Basically, it's not private at all. Everything 
Um, everything about yourself is revealed to the exchange because they're, they're going to want KYC and all that kind of stuff. Maybe one day they'll decide that, um, I don't know, the government decides to crack down and say, no more privacy coins on centralized exchanges. We're already kind of seeing that, to be honest. So yeah, this is not really a, a good solution for long term. Um, and then yeah, there's also like bridges, which are often used, but as far as I know, there aren't really any Monero bridges that are currently working. Um, bridges kind of range from centralized to decentralized, um, and the level of privacy is um, okay, depending on like what the L1s you're swapping with are, but generally um, on the non-private chain, your addresses and the amounts that are swapped are gonna be revealed. Um, and yeah, and usually with bridges, they have like a third party, like relayers and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, there's a third party. But for atomic swaps, um, I would say that it's most similar to, to, for example, like a local Monero type situation, except on your computer. So it's basically like the optimal amount or I'm not gonna say optimal, but it's a much better amount of, of privacy. Um, it's decentralized, um, it's trustless, it's totally peer to peer. There's just two parties, you and the other person. Um, yeah, you don't really have to rely on anyone. Um, yeah, so yeah, so basically in general, your addresses and the amounts are going to be still revealed on the chain that is not um, private by default. So for example, if you swap like ETH to Monero or Bitcoin to Monero, like on the ETH or Bitcoin side, like it's not private at all still. But maybe there could be ways to prevent this. Okay, cool. So yeah, so why Ethereum? Um, so basically Ethereum is the largest blockchain by usage. It's number two by market cap. Like it's huge. It's easy to get ETH, um, same with Bitcoin. Like you can just go to an ATM or like whatever place that sells uh, crypto and you just buy it. Um, it's way easier to get your hands on than Monero. Um, unfortunately, so basically by having um, an atomic swap between ETH and Monero, it greatly increases the accessibility. Um, so like in the scenario I previously mentioned where centralized exchanges decide to ban privacy coins or whatever, privacy coins become really hard to get, um, atomic swaps are gonna be a pretty needed method for obtaining them. Um, yeah, and then also there's, I don't know, potentially maybe an, an ability to integrate it directly with DeFi, because as we all know, Ethereum is the home of DeFi and, I don't know, tokens, NFTs, all that like fun jazz. So there might be a way to, um, yeah, it would essentially make it easier to on-ramp to those kind of things. Cool, so yeah, so the project. So yeah, so I started this project back in October. Um, so basically the project is, um, yeah, first I created the protocol for ETH Monero Atomic Swaps, um, and it essentially uses a smart contract as the sort of heavy lifting, so it manages like the claim and refund um, functionalities. Um, yeah, and I guess like personally, like this is something I would use, like I know a lot of people that would use it, so I think that it's something that will be very handy. Um, yeah, and so yeah, the currently implementation that I'm working on is being written in Go. So Go is kind of a, I don't know, newer-ish systems language. Um, it has really nice concurrency primitives. I really like it. Um, yeah, it's easy to read, it's easy to learn. So I figured that also writing it in a more accessible language would be really nice, um, as opposed to something more like esoteric maybe. Um, yeah, so some notable code base features that I've added so far. So there, I added a um, Go ED25519 library for Monero, um, like addresses and signing and that kind of stuff, um, private key management. Um, there wasn't really anything like this in Go, so I think, yeah, hopefully it'll be useful if someone wants to develop Monero stuff in Go. Um, and then also I added a networking layer, so it's using a library called loop P2P, which is a open source peer-to-peer -peer library for networking. Um, I really like it. Um, so it includes also a DH DHT um, for peer discovery. So this is um, a distributed hash table. I'm gonna go into it more later, what it's used for, but essentially you can discover um, peers and offers on the network in a decentralized manner. Cool, so yeah, development progress. So I think back in December, I started the CCS, um, started the CCS process for this, and I think in January it got funded and accepted. So first of all, thank you everyone for funding it. Um, huge thank you for the community, so yeah. <laughs> um, cool, so yeah, so some of the development progress that I've done so far. So in the milestone, oh, in the CCS, there's seven milestones. 
Um, so the first four are essentially done or mostly done. So quickly, um, so the first one is essentially um, feature completion and just unit tests and that kind of thing. Um, so this was implementing like the um, the refund paths, like um, a little recovery module in case like your node crashes halfway through or something like that. Um, so that's done. The second is a swap contract. I'm going to call it factory, um, essentially for gas savings. So gas is like a meter of, I don't know how much stuff costs on Ethereum. So basically less gas equals cheaper. So um, in the very first iteration, um, the swap contract was just like a one-time thing that you had to deploy every time. But um, that's pretty expensive to deploy a contract, especially if a lot of it is going to be the same every time. So the milestone, milestone two essentially turned it into um, one contract that's deployed once on chain by, by whoever. And then from there, you can just call a function in it to easily instantiate a new swap. Um, so it saves a lot of gas because you don't want to deploy something every time. Um, it's probably like 3x cheaper or something like that, I think, to start a swap. Um, and then the third one is um, something called discrete logarithm equality integration, um, also for gas saving. So this is kind of a protocol update to the swap. Um, so it essentially allows you to verify uh, SECP keys on the, the contract um, instead of ED25509 keys, which were happening before. So if anyone doesn't know, SECP is native to Ethereum. ED25509 is um, what Monero uses. So it's essentially a lot cheaper to use SECP on um, Ethereum. Um, just because like there's built-ins essentially for it, so yeah, that's what the second milestone does. I'm gonna. I said it's mostly done because it's done in the code base, but it uses on the back end a Rust library to do the proofs. Um, and I wanted to do a Go implementation of it as well, just because I don't know. It'll be nicer to maintain. Um, don't have to deal with like funny language bindings and that kind of thing. Um, and then. Fourth milestone, integration testing. So this is basically like automated tests that run like two nodes and go through all the, the success and refund, et cetera, and uh, yeah, go through all the success and refund paths. Um, this is done. Um, and then the fifth one is stage net testing. So basically deploying a bunch of nodes um, on remote servers and just doing some automated testing on them, just like running a bunch of swaps for like a long period of time, kind of making sure everything is good, nothing funny is happening. Um, and then milestone six is going to be research for Swap v2. So this is hopefully going to be a improved protocol with improved privacy and more features, like maybe token integration. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a lot more about this part later because this is what I've been researching. Um, and then the seventh one is just a UI. So yeah, I showed you the UI later or earlier, but um, yeah, we're essentially just going to make it really nice, <laughs> um, put MetaMask into it. Cool, so I think, yeah, so privacy for atomic swap. So since we're all here, um, we obviously all like privacy. So you might be wondering, how is your privacy preserved in an atomic swap? So yeah, this is something that I'm pretty interested in, in researching. So yeah, so for privacy, we essentially want to have three different um, components um, that are satisfied. So the first one is anonymity. So basically just hiding um, who participated in the swap. So in this case, it would be the addresses. Um, confidentiality, which is hiding the amounts that are swapped. So yeah, so Monero has this by default, um, but other chains do not. Um, and then indistinguishability, which is hiding that a swap happened at all. So making the swap transaction look the exact same as any other transaction. Um, so how do, um, current atomic swaps measure up to these. So on the Monero side, they're basically satisfied because of the fact that Monero is private by default. But on the, for example, the Bitcoin Monero atomic swaps or the ETH Monero atomic swaps on the Bitcoin or ETH side that doesn't have privacy, these aren't really satisfied at all. So how might we satisfy them? That's the question. So yeah, and then another concern is also um, yeah, network level privacy versus chain level privacy. So what um, information can you determine from looking at the swap network and seeing um, on the peer to peer level, like what's happening? So, um, so yeah, so for example, like what metadata can be leaked from watching the swap network? So one method that could be used to potentially link a transaction on um, a transparent or chain like Ethereum versus one like Monero um, would be like timing correlations. So for example, you see like someone makes an offer, someone else takes it, and then like right after you see these two transactions on both chains, you can probably correlate 
to somewhat of a high degree that there was an atomic swap happening there. Um, especially if you can correlate like someone's IP that's on the network with an address or something like that. So that's kind of concerning. Um, and then also who's interested in getting Monero or who's interested in getting ETH, um, basically, I'm gonna talk about this a bit more later, but you can basically find out everyone who's on the network who's doing this, um, as well as amounts that people are offering um, to swap. So from that, you can basically like extrapolate that someone has at least this much, unless they're like a malicious node that's just like on there for whatever reason, don't actually have that much. So um, yeah, so how does this, oh yeah, and then on the chain level, I think I have another slide for that after, but so essentially how does this affect the privacy of those doing swaps? So the first concern is linkability. So what's the next one? Um, so basically, um, for example, on Ethereum, um, in the swap contract, you have to unfortunately have ETH to get more ETH due to the fact that you have to pay gas fees to call the function that um, will let you claim the ETH. So this is pretty bad because you can link two ETH accounts together. Um, like if you try to do it from two separate accounts, um, obviously it's probably you again. Um, and then you can, like I said earlier with timing correlations, you can link two transactions on different chains and maybe you can, from the the swap, um, from seeing how much ETH someone received, you can infer how much Monero the other person received as well. Um, so yeah, that's some linkability concerns. Um, and then yeah, and then another method, or another factor that's pretty important in the privacy, I would say, is how you actually find um, the offers on the network. So there's a couple of ways that a swap provider can advertise themselves. So the first most obvious but centralized solution is to just have a website. So you can just publish on this website um, that you're making an offer. Um, so this is obviously centralized because it's on someone's website. Like maybe you could, I don't know, have a bunch of people hosting the website, but essentially it's, it's centralized. Um, and this also makes you kind of vulnerable to phishing attacks because people might just, I don't know, try to fish people, send them a fake swap website and then just grief them or, or whatever. So um, yeah, not really that great of a uh, solution for advertisement of the offers, um, as well as really easy to see like all the offers because they're just like on this website. Um, and then another, so yeah, a couple other methods that you could use are um, a DHT, a distributed hash table. So a distributed hash table is like a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, um, table that's used for um, content storing and lookup. So in usually in the blockchain context, this is used for peer discovery. In the atomic swap implementation that I'm doing right now, um, I'm using it for um, both peer discovery and also offer discovery. So um, if someone wants to make an offer, they publish it into the DHT. Um, this way it's, it's decentralized, it's uncensorable. Like on a website, someone could just censor it if they don't want you to partake. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Um, it somewhat protects against um, attacks where someone might try to look through all of the offers in the network. Um, it would, you would probably be able to find them all, but there isn't a guarantee that you would be able to find them all. Um, and then yeah, another method could be a gossip network. So this is essentially just, um, you would have a DHT for only peer discovery and then after you discover the peers, you would just send messages around the network offering um, swaps and taking them. So this is also kind of nice. It's decentralized as well, also peer to peer, but there'd just be more, um, I don't know, potentially more message latency, potentially. Um, it's just not as simple to implement. You have to implement like a bit of a messaging protocol that might potentially protect against um, enumeration concerns, which is in the next slide. So enumeration is basically um, a metadata leakage where you can find everyone on the network and all their IPs. So um, on a website, pretty trivial to do that. Um, on a DHT, it's like not as trivial, but you can still do it. Um, and um, yeah, and then what else? And then yeah, on a ghost network, this might be harder because maybe, I don't know, maybe you say, you say put out a message saying I'm looking for these offers and only maybe a few people reply and not everyone replies, like something like that. Um, but either way, it's, kind of concerning because you can usually just like put all these IPs in a table and say, these are all the people with Monero or something like that. Um, cool, and then 
Yeah, so other, so yeah, potential attacks due to centralization. So this is sort of relating to like just advertising on a website. Um, you can maybe make a bajillion like false offers and grief people. So um, the way the protocol works is that um, the ETH holder has to lock their ETH first. And as we all know, ETH gas fees are kind of high, um, especially at certain times. So um, an attack could be like make a bajillion um, Monero offers saying like, oh, I have this Monero, I want ETH. Um, get, get people to um, lock ETH and then basically the swap will time out um, and then the refund path will trigger, but this person has now lost gas. Um, and if you do that like a lot of times, um, it would, yeah, it would basically let me them run out of funds. So, um, so yeah, so basically one, yes, yeah, so this is kind of hard to do with a decentralized method, which is nice because you would essentially have to cut them off from the rest of the, the network um, so that they wouldn't be able to find any other providers apart from your like evil providers. So say you're like on the network, you're in node with ETH, you want Monero, um, so maybe you're on, if you're on a phishing website, this is pretty easy because then all those offers would be fake and someone can just grief you. Um, but if you're on a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, this would be a lot harder because um, DHTs, for example, um, a lot of gossip algorithms have methods that prevent eclipse attacks built in. So when eclipse attack is essentially like when your node gets segregated from the rest of the network and it's only connected to malicious nodes. So, so yeah, so overall I think um, yeah, depending on, this is like concerns that are unrelated to the swap protocol itself and more just related to like the actual implementation of it. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I don't know, pretty important to consider. So um, what else? So yeah, so on the, um, some goals for privacy. So yeah, so on the network level, um, a few things could be done to um, add more privacy. Um, uh, yeah, so the first one is um, just sender recipient anonymity. So basically saying that like if you send someone a message, they shouldn't know who you are and you shouldn't know who they are. Um, like the IPs should be hidden. Um, and then anonymity of swap providers. So you shouldn't be able to easily go through the network, find everyone who's a provider on the network. Um, same with lookups um, or queries for providers. Shouldn't be able to easily find everyone who's um, querying on the network. Um, confidentiality, confidentiality of swap amounts. So right now when you advertise an offer, you say the amounts as well. Um, ideally, you would not have to do this. Um, you'd be able to do it confidential, confidentially somehow. Um, and then on the chain level, um, there's a few goals as well. So essentially you wanna make, these are really basically the same three points I said earlier. So you wanna make this to the swap transactions indistingu indistinguishable from the others. Um, you want to hide the swap amounts on chain as well. Um, and you want ideally to have anonymity of the swap participants. Um, yeah, so how can we improve the privacy? So on the network level, there's a few things we can do. Um, so very basic is just like use a VPN. If you join the network, that way your real IP isn't published on the network. Um, however, obviously a VPN is centralized, they still maybe have the logs, that kind of thing. So it's better than just like putting your home IP, for example, um, but not exactly ideal. Um, another one is onion routing. So this is essentially Tor um, or what Tor uses. So your all your network messages are wrapped through a few layers of encryption that get unwrapped. So this hides the, um, the sender of a message um, and the receiver of a message. So yeah, so having this would be pretty nice because you don't have to, um, yeah, you wouldn't essentially reveal the IPs of who you're swapping with, um, as well as if you do like lookups or that kind of thing. So that's pretty nice. Um, yeah, but um, Tor is still somewhat vulnerable, or not somewhat, but like it is vulnerable to um, like uh, correlation attacks. So essentially like packet size and timing attacks. Um, so while it's like a pretty, I don't know, it's pretty good, but not perfect. Um, and then there's also MixNet. So MixNet is probably like the most advanced level of network level privacy. Um, so basically your, all messages are routed through um, like a, a mix of nodes. So all the nodes that are being routed through are called a mix and they essentially pack it, package different messages together. Um, they um, hold the messages for maybe some random amount of time. So it's harder to do timing correlations. Um, you can't do size correlations as well since the packets are all like 
um, blob together essentially and they only get unwrapped at the final layer. Um, yeah, so it, essentially a mix net would be like a very ideal situation um, in terms of a, uh, swap privacy or I don't know, any sort of privacy on the network level really. Um, but I'm not currently aware at the moment of mix sets that would really be good for atomic swaps. Um, a lot of them are built for sort of other purposes like um, a secure messaging and that kind of thing. Um, like more like, I don't know, message, messenger type things. Um, but yeah, something to research for sure. And then another thing would be like privacy preserving DHT schemes. So um, a way to preserve the privacy of people advertising and doing lookups on the DHT. Um, right now, there also isn't really that much out there on this. So this is another area that I think would be really good to research. Um, cool, and then on the chain level, so a few methods would be maybe timing delays for on-chain transactions. So you can't easily do timing correlations on um, the swap transactions. Um, obviously another one is layer one privacy. So Monero is like pretty good to go in general. Um, obviously it has L1 privacy, but ETH, Bitcoin don't. Um, however, on Ethereum, there are, um, like Rachel mentioned earlier, there's um, something called ZK money, which is like a zero knowledge layer two um, privacy solution for Ethereum. So potentially if you could swap into that directly, it would preserve um, the anonymity and confidentiality of your, of your swap. Um, however, it might need like contracting functionality or that kind of thing. I'm not sure if that's released yet. I don't think it is. So that might not be um, that feasible at the moment, but definitely something that I think would be really nice to implement in the future, just direct swaps for these like private wrap tokens. Um, and then another thing, the last two are a bit more of like research topics. Um, so scriptless swaps. So potentially there could be a way to do an atomic swap without requiring any sort of scripting functionality on other chain. So this would be like the ideal solution in a lot of ways because it would satisfy indistinguishability, which is that um, like a swap transaction would look the exact same as any others on like both chains, even if the L1 doesn't have any privacy. Um, because currently the way it works is that there's some sort of script on um, Bitcoin or ETH that performs some sort of like swap related functionality. And you can easily just like look at it and tell that there's something like that happening. Um, so yeah, a scriptless swap would essentially remove that, um, that on-chain kind of layer that you've done a swap. Um, yeah, and then a last thing would be multi-party swaps. So maybe potentially, I'm not sure if this is feasible, but this is something interesting I think to think about, um, potentially having multiple participants in a swap, sort of having like a greater anonymity set for the swap. So you can maybe like um, have plausible desirability of who you swapped with um, and that kind of thing. So yeah, just something I think would be very cool to research. Um, cool, and then future work for the implementation that I'm doing. So um, yeah, so essentially I would like to work on a, or I've been working on a version two of the protocol with um, gas improvements. So reducing the amount of stuff that's happening in the contract on chain um, to save a lot of fees on the ETH side, privacy improvements. So basically all the stuff I just mentioned, both network level and chain level improvements. Um, um, direct swaps for ERC-20s. So yeah, this is something that people have been pretty interested in. So maybe a way to directly swap for, um, yeah, like any sort of ERC-20, maybe even like um, ERC-721s, aka NFTs. Um, yeah, I think this is like pretty doable and something that would be pretty valuable, I think. Um, that way you can directly swap from, swap from whatever token directly into Monero and um, same for the other direction. Um, yeah, and then network level privacy. So yeah, I kind of already mentioned that, but um, yeah, discovery, advertisement, um, that kind of thing. Cool, so back to the demo. So I'm hoping that the swap finished. I don't know how long it's been, but we're gonna look at it and see. Um, okay, it's still actually running. <laughs> so I think Stasia is like going really slow today. Um, okay, my note is synced. But it, it might take, let me see how long it's been since we started. Uh, do, 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 do. Where is it? I have to scroll up a lot. Okay, here it is. So what time is that? 4.13? <laughs> and now it's 4.39. Okay, it's been a long time. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna, I guess, talk a few more minutes and hopefully 
Um, yeah, hopefully that will, I don't know, finish. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone know how much time I have left? <laughs> how, do you know how much time I have left? Um, we're actually, if you don't mind, oh. Up. Okay, well, the swap ended up taking really long, so everyone mind some station at please to speed up the chain. <laughs> um, cool, so that's basically it. Um, so yeah, if you want, you can check out the GitHub. There's instructions on how to run it. There's instructions on the protocol um, in github.com slash newt slash atomic swap. Um, I have in these slides also like a bunch of stuff on how the protocol works, like nice slides, so I'm gonna post that in the repo as well. You can find me on Twitter at Elizabethurium. Um, yeah, cool. Thank you everyone for, for watching. Awesome. Thank you so much.